This is Strat Gaming, and what I have for you today is a complete guide to the different cultures of Bannerlord. We will be testing culture bonuses, looking at spawn locations, as well as attribute and focus point combinations from the starting selection. There are six different cultures to choose from, so let's go in order and start with Vlandia. If we choose a Vlandian character, we will get plus 5 renown from battles, 15% more income while serving as a mercenary, and 10% production to castles villages. For the drawback, calling parties into an army will cost 20% more influence. Let's take a look at how these actually work in game. When we win a battle of any kind, we are rewarded with renown. In this case, we auto resolve a battle with some bandits and earn 3.4. Hovering the mouse over that value, we can see the base renown gain of 3.25 plus the culture bonus of 0.16, which is 5%. Once we become a mercenary, we will have a contract rate per influence earned, but this does not include the culture bonus. In this case, Big Daddy Durthurt blesses us with 180 dinars per influence, but we can see the actual earnings with the bonus is 207. 15% of 180 is 27, so this perk works as intended. Don't be fooled by this number. It's not difficult to be earning three to 4,000 dinars per day from a mercenary contract, and 15% of that would be a 450 to 600 dinar increase. If we own castles, then the attached villages will have an extra 10% boost to their production, which ultimately translates to more money in your pockets. Without the culture bonus, and after three days, this farm produces 139 grain, as well as a few extras like livestock. Once we take ownership of this castle, the same three-day period increases the grain production to 154, which is almost 11% more. This extra grain will be taken to the closest town and sold with the money coming back to the village after and paid out to us as the owner. Finally, we test the 20% increase for calling armies into the party. We see a Vlandian culture on the left and Kazay culture on the right, but something isn't quite right. Looking at the bottom two nobles specifically, it would cost 25 influence to call Valeric's party into an army, and 27 for Vartans, for a Vlandian, but 31 and 32 respectively for a Kazate. The troop count is nearly identical, so influence cost should be around 20% more for the Vlandian, but the opposite is actually true. It's 5 to 6 influence less for the Vlandian, which is about 20% difference between the two. It appears that Tail Worlds misplaced a negative sign somewhere, and it's actually 20% cheaper to call parties into our army. Once we pick our culture, we get to build our character skills and points with 6 different options per pick and five different groups or stages of life to pick from. Each pick will give one attribute point and two focus points, but not all cultures have the same picks which leads to different starting character builds. Some basic math here. There are 7,776 different possible character builds, so let's quickly go through each and every one of them. I'm joking that would take more than a year straight to get through it, so instead I organized all picks into a database so we can glean useful information quickly. Starting with attribute points, we can see that most stages have six different attribute point options, but level four youth has only five, with two of the options giving endurance and none giving social. For the focus points, most skills have three to four focus points possible, with a few having only two, and two having only one, scouting and medicine. Vlandia is also the only culture to get four roguery focus points options, so it's a great pick for all you aspiring scoundrel bandits. Finally, let's look at the spawn location for Vlandia. We get plopped down to the southwest outside of Sargo. It's not far from Batania lands, which would be great for a smithing start. It's also close to the towns with Asurai horses, so not a bad spot for a trader start as well. Next up, Sturgia. The first bonus is quite good and gives a 25% reduction in cost to recruiting and upgrading infantry troops. Looking at the recruiting screen, tier 1 infantry would normally cost 20 dinars, but are instead 15 or 25% less. Tier 2 are 38 instead of 50, and tier 3 are 75 instead of 100. For upgrades, we see 11 dinars to promote to tier 2, which is indeed 25% less than 15. From tier 2 to tier 3 it should cost 25, but instead is reduced to 18. Tier 3 to tier 4 should be 50, but is now 38. Tail Worlds is generous because they do round down for us. Notice once we get to the Archer upgrade, there is no discount. Archers and crossbowmen do not count as infantry, so they do not get the discount, but upgrading an infantry unit into an Archer does give the discount. Finally, from tier 4 to tier 5, it's normally 100, but is now only 
75. The archer is still full price though. The next bonus allows Sturgeon armies to lose 20% less cohesion. We can see this army would normally be losing 6 cohesion per day, but is reduced by 1.2 or 20% down to 4.8 per day. So an army that would normally break apart after 4 days would instead keep going for 5 days, which is a great boost for early and mid game. For the relations testing, we take our charm skill down to level 1 and call for a vote to remove Olex Fief. Using the tier 3 influence cost, we get a 20 relations hit from the vote. We also vote for ourselves to get Omor, giving another 6 relations hit with 2 other clans. Next, we reload our Asurai character and repeat the tests. We see the same 20 relations hit for the removal vote, but only 5 for the new owner vote. It seems we only get the 20% relation hit for certain types of votes, but not all. Now let's look at some stats for character building. For attribute points, there are now 2 stages that only have 5 options. Stage 3 Adolescence doesn't have a cunning option, and Stage 4 Youth doesn't have social. Again, here most skills have 3-4 to four picks for each skill, but Crossbow and Stuart only have 1. The starting location for Sturgia is right on the border with Batania and the Northern Empire, making it an ideal place to start a smithing playthrough. My biggest issue with Sturgia is the travel time to get from one end of that empire to the other, oftentimes taking several days and covered in thick forests, which slows movement speed greatly. Now we look at the most populous culture on the map, the Empire. There are more Empire fiefs on the map than any other culture, and it's not even close. Their bonuses are also quite good. A 20% reduction in garrison wages is a huge bonus, making fiefs a bit more profitable. In this garrison, we have 100 troops of all sorts. To check the wages of the castle, we click on the clan tab, then party screen, and go to Ordrissa Castle. Then hover the mouse over the current wages, which we can see a base of 489 with a discount of 97.8, which is 20%. Garrison wages can easily exceed two to 3,000 dinars per day, and 20% discount from this would be 400 to 600 per garrison. If you own five fiefs, we're talking several thousands per day in savings. The next bonus gives 25% more influence for being part of an army. When we or any of our companions join an army, we get a certain amount of influence per day. We can join up with an army as an empire culture character and gain 4.07 influence per day with our 300 tier 5 troop army. Using our Sturgeon character and joining the exact same army, we can see the influence gain is now only 3.25. Adding 25% should be 4.0625, but Tail Worlds is generous and rounds up for us once more. We can also get free influence by starting our own army and calling our companion parties into it. We start with our Empire character, 3 companions, and 100 tier 5 troops in each party. After calling all 3 in, we can see an influence gain of 4.35 per day. We reload the game with our Asteroid character and use the exact same setup, but only gain 3.46 influence this time. This is a great way to gain tons of influence all through your campaign, and with an Empire character, you will grow influence significantly faster. Finally, we test the downside of picking Empire, the minus 20% hearth growth for villages. Hearths are a somewhat complicated mechanic, so we won't go into detail in this guide, but just know it's responsible for village production, food production that goes towards the castle or town and keeps the population from starving, and governs the villager party and militia size. Needless to say, hearths are important and bigger is better. We can see this village has a hearth growth rate of 0.6 base, but we must subtract 0.12 because of our culture. Moving on to the character creation. For attribute points, Empire also have two levels with only five options. Three, Adolescence does not have a cunning option, and four, Youth doesn't have a social option. When it comes to focus points, Empire is well balanced with only Stuart having one option. Almost everything else has three to four options for a build, so Empire is a good choice for many different types of starts. The starting location leaves a bit to be desired as we spawn in the southeast outside of Danustica. My best piece of advice is to stay away from Kazate lands and even the borders until you have 30 or more troops in your party. Step bandits can easily swarm you and they are hard to deal with using early game troops. We're halfway there and move on to the Asurai. The first culture bonus reduces the cost of forming caravans by 30%. Using our Batanian character we can see a cost of 15,000 to hire the normal caravan and 22.5 for the upgraded one. Switching over to our Asurai character we see this cost reduces down to 10,500 for standard and 15,750 for the upgraded caravan which is exactly 30% less. The second part of this bonus reduces the trade penalty by 10% which should result in cheaper buying and selling prices. For these tests we reduce our character's trade level to 1 for both. Looking at the most expensive item in the game with our Asteroid character we see a price of 63,100 and switching over to Patanian culture results in the exact same price. To make sure this wasn't a fluke we buy a piece of armor 
over and check both the purchase and sell price. We can purchase this item for 286 and sell it for 105. Loading back to our asteroid character, we see the same 286 purchase price and 105 sale price. One final test, we increase the trade level to 300 to make sure prices are in fact changing with the reduction to trade penalty. That same late game armor now is priced at 88,232, so trade penalty is in fact working, but this cultural bonus is certainly not. It's unfortunate. The second perk removes the speed penalty while moving through a desert. We see a 0.5 movement speed penalty for our Batanian character, but no speed penalty for deserts for our Asurite character. Finally, we check the drawback perk, which increases troop wages by 5%. This small party adds an extra 8 dinars per day to the existing 160 dinars per day wages, which is exactly 5%. Looking at the character creation for Asurai, we see now three stages that offer only five attribute options, the most limited so far. Stage one family is missing intelligence, stage three adolescence is missing cunning, and stage four youth is missing social. Asurai is mostly balanced with Crossbow and Stuart having only one option throughout. The spawn location for Asurai is quite good as it's relatively safe for most bandit hideouts. It's very close to the premium horse trade routes and not too far from Batania and Empire for a smithing start. Now for the Mongols, uh, I mean Kazates. Sorry, Chingus. The first bonus reduces recruiting and upgrade costs of mounted troops by 10%. Looking at recruitment first, we see an issue. The tier 4 cavalry costs 315, which is 10% less than 350, but the tier 4 cavalry archer is not discounted at all and still costs 350. We see the same for the tier 3 unit with cavalry costing 225 and cav archer costing 250. Apparently, they forgot to add cav archers as mounted troops. Let's now look at troop upgrades to see if it functions properly. We see no upgrade going from infantry into cavalry, which is expected. From tier 2 to tier 3, we do see a discount of 10%, with normal troops costing 25 to upgrade, but these troops costing only 22. Tier 3 and tier 4 cost 45 instead of 50 for both mounted units, and finally tier 4 to tier 5, both costing 90 instead of 100. Upgrade costs are working correctly, but recruitment costs only work for melee cavalry and not ranged. The next culture bonus increases animal production by a massive 25%. We start by testing production using our asteroid character to get the baseline. After 10 days of production, we see 4 Sumter, 10 Mule, 14 Desert, and 5 asteroid horses. Repeating the same test with our Kazate character, after 10 days, our village has produced 9 Sumter, 13 Mule, 20 Desert, and 6 asteroid horses. If we take the sale price from the Kazate testing, we can see the total sale price of 72.78 dinars under asteroid ownership and 96.95 dinars under Kuzate ownership. This is an increase of 24.17 or a 33% increase. If we average that out, it comes to 241 dinars per day for one village, which is quite good. Now for the negative. Each town we own will give 20% less taxes. Taking a look at the settlement tax breakdown, we can see a line item for minus 224, which is 20% of the prosperity. It looks like they take it only from the base and not the bonuses you have like security, loyalty, and market marketplace. This debuff only works for towns and does not affect castles. The character creation for Kazate is similar to Sturgia with two stages having only five attributes and two skills with one option. Stage 3 Adolescence is missing Cunning and Stage 4 Youth is missing Social. Crossbow and Stuart have only one option, but the rest are fairly well balanced. You can only pick up to three riding option though, which is odd considering who they are modeled after. We spawn in the northeast outside of Makeb in Kazate territory. It's a great place to pick up far farm animals since they are produced in abundance here, which can help early for early trade routes. Step bandits can be an issue, so make sure you have 20 to 30 troops in your party. Tail worlds, did you really save the best for last? Batania is my favorite culture to play as, and it's not just the Fian champions and the movement speed in forests, but also the militia production bonus and easy smithing start. The first bonus gives a 50% speed penalty reduction and 15% sight range while traveling through forests. We can see in game that forests give a minus 1.5 movement speed penalty, but the culture bonus adds back in 0.75. The sight range is increased from 12 to 13.8 as well. Once we take a town, we will get a plus one per day bonus to militia increase, which ends up making quite a big difference. Pairing this with great policies that increase militia quality and quantity, and a governor with great perks, you might not even need a garrison to defend. The only drawback is that building speed is reduced by 10%. We can see under the construction dropdown, there is a line item for minus 4.36. It appears that this bonus is taken after all other modifiers are taken into account, so it will reduce bonuses as well, unfortunately. Tailworlds does not like to standardize their order of operations. 
For character creation using Batania, we see a similar pattern. Attribute points have two stages with five options. Stage 3 Adolescence doesn't have Cutting, and Stage 4 Youth doesn't have Social. For focus points, most are well balanced with three to four options, except Crossbow and Steward having only one. It appears Tail Worlds hates both of those skills. When it comes to spawn location, I think Batania has one of the best. The spawn is right outside Maranath and only a short stroll away from Seonan, which has thousands of hardwood at the start for only four dinars each. It's a great way to start off a smithing run. Batania also has cheap pack animals, which can be a great way to start a training run. There are tons of forests around, so enemy kingdoms and bandits will have a hard time catching you. And there you have it, all six cultures to pick from. The takeaway here for me was that some cultures have better bonuses for different stages of the game. For example, Vlandia is great for early game with a renown boost to get higher clan tiers and extra income from mercenary contracts, but these bonuses fall off in the late game when renown is pointless and money has little to no value. Empire is extremely powerful in the late game with significantly cheaper garrison wages and earning more influence when joining armies which can be spent on voting for fiefs or passing policies. There are also more Empire fiefs than others in Calradia, making it an ideal candidate for rapid expansion while avoiding rebellions. Then there is Batania, who are in a league of their own. The movement speed bonus alone is S tier, but then you add in the extra militia for free, and it's an overwhelmingly powerful culture. When it comes to character creation, I don't think there's a huge difference between one culture and another. Most builds can be done with any culture, and early levels for most skills will level up fast enough to make starting levels negligible. If you like this kind of content and want to see more like it, consider subscribing. Thank you so much for your time and I'll see you on the next one. Have a nice day.